It's time to shed light on our universe. This is All Things Photonics, a podcast about the physical science of light. Join us as we explore the latest in lasers, optics, spectroscopy, and microscopy. Each episode, you'll hear from leading voices from across the photonics landscape. We're brought to you by Photonics Media. This is Associate Editor Joel Williams. Here are this week's top stories. An optical biometric authentication tool developed by researchers at SUNY Buffalo uses photoacoustic tomography to map a subject's finger veins in 3D. The technique could provide a nearly uncrackable security method. Tests showed that the method performed with 99% accuracy in accepting or rejecting identities. Researchers from the Leibniz Institute of Photonic Technology and Friedrich Schiller University have developed a copper complex-based chemical system for molecularly storing solar energy for at least 14 hours. The system decouples photochemical processes from the day-night cycle, bypassing a barrier that had previously made solar-powered photochemistry unsuitable for continuous industrial production. A system developed by researchers at Tohoku University captures 3D images, enabling the detection of defects in metallic structures. The technology, called the Piezoelectric and Laser Ultrasonic System, combines the strengths of two different devices to produce its high-resolution 3D images of metallic structure defects and could enhance safety in power plants and airplanes, among other areas and applications. To overcome the limitations of high-speed volumetric imaging due to slow axial scanning rates or aberrations introduced by the Z-scanning mechanism, scientists at UT Southwestern have introduced a novel optical design that transforms a lateral scan motion into a scan in the third dimension. The technique allowed the microscope to achieve a laser focusing rate of 12 kHz and allowed the observation of fast dynamics inside cells and the beating hearts of zebrafish embryos. And finally, An endoscope that combines photoacoustic and fluorescence imaging, and that is about as thick as a human hair, could one day provide insight into the brain by enabling simultaneous measurement of blood dynamics and neuronal activity. The researchers responsible for developing the device fabricated a prototype and used it to image fluorescent beads and blood cells using both imaging modalities. They successfully detected multiple 1 micrometer fluorescent beads in individual 6 micrometer red blood cells. Up next, news editor Jake Saltzman speaks with Stanford University's Dr. Manu Prakash. I'm Joel Williams, and this is All Things Photonics. Today's episode is sponsored by MKS Instruments. We have you covered with our full portfolio of solutions in the areas of optics, photonics, lasers, vibration control, and precision motion control. Surround the Workpiece is an MKS offering that includes product design and development, system level integration, research and development, system, subsystem, and component selection, and maintenance, repair, and calibration services in the field of laser-based guidance and control for manufacturing processes. For more information about Surround the Workpiece, please visit www.newport.com. And by Comsol, the leading developer of multi-physics simulation software, which includes tools for building and deploying simulation apps. Comsol's wave and ray optics capabilities are used for modeling, imaging, and sensing in consumer electronics and biotechnology, information processing and communication systems, and more. See how the Comsol software fits your optical analysis needs at www.comsol.com. Our guest today is a MacArthur Fellow, 2020 Unilever Colworth Prize recipient from the Microbiology Society and Stanford University Professor of Bioengineering. His influence is felt worldwide, as he is also an inventor of devices including the Foldscope Microscope and Paperfuge, an aptly named centrifuge made from paper. 
Dr. Manu Prakash, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. We'll start with a uh, reminiscence question. It's been about 10 years since you conceived this idea that has since expanded rapidly uh, and extensively. Now tens of thousands of individuals around the world literally experience science firsthand. Uh, tell us about the so full it, scope. It's actually around a million people now. Last year, we tallied up there is a million full scopes out there now. Congratulations. Yeah, I think Foldscope uh, has had a journey of its own in some sense. It started as an idea. Uh, we conceived it as a way to bring microscopy to literally everyone. And when you think about that, you really have to think hard about cost, and we were looking for an analogy. So to me, Foldscope is almost like a pencil of microscopy. This is something that you have with you. It's an affordable tool like a pencil, but it's still incredibly powerful to an extent that you can watch for a price point of roughly a dollar. You could be imaging single bacteria literally anywhere. It's built by origami. You fold it together. It's a flat sheet of paper. All the optics, electronics is embedded in a manner that allows you to put it together. But you get the joy of building it to begin with and decouple it from just being a black box. Uh, you get to see the simplicity of the technology itself in your own hands. So before this was a, uh, well, this was still a concept. What happened to inspire this idea that has since led to it being placed in the hands of millions? I think, uh, so I run a lab at Stanford, and one of the big things that I often think about is this context of frugal science, the fact that ideas exist in a framework of our society, and that implies that cost is at the heart of the uh, equation if we want something to touch millions of lives. We started with a framework to ensure that we put the constraints on us before we ever built anything. So the constraint was that it had to be able to image, you know, micron resolution objects, but be able to do that for a price point of a dollar. And that constraint essentially allowed us to be thinking like this. But then once we published the paper and we demonstrated that something works, you know, my graduate student and I, who's also a co-inventor of Foldscope with me, Jim Sabalski, we asked ourselves a question to truly prove that something like this is feasible in the world. We will make 50,000 of them in the lab. And that was the aha moment that really sparked uh, essentially a revolution for us because we were going far beyond saying, look, this is possible to actually doing this in a lab setting. And I still remember that day, I just posted on our lab's website a small blurb saying, anybody who wants a full scope, we will ship one to you. And we literally shipped the first 50,000 of them in the lab at our own cost. You know, we were sending them to Sudan, Bolivia, uh, Alaska, everywhere around the world. And what that created is a community. And frankly, now when I look back, it's almost been seven years or so now, it's the full scope community that's as important as the tool itself. So we were able to essentially bring this to people around the world that would have never thought about microscopy to play a role in their lives. You know, these people range from taxi drivers to somebody working at home or homeschooling all the way to scientists and uh, expedition experts. And this gamete of community is really what makes Foldscope tick. You now have, through the Foldscope, you have this network around the world of eyes and ears too, but eyes on the ground across the world. What does that mean to you as a, a scientist who is committed to sort of spreading the wealth and spreading the knowledge? Yeah, I think that's a really fascinating point. The idea that there is literally a million eyes on the microscopic world. I mean, we are surrounded by the microscopic world, so it's ubiquitous yet invisible, which is a concept that it's a little hard to grasp in our everyday lives. How can be something be everywhere but still not visible to us? And I think in just as personally this notion that literally while we are talking on the phone or somebody listening to this podcast, there are kids around the world looking at their environment at this very moment. 
and very importantly, sharing their data, because full scope connects with cell phones, if you have one, it does not require a cell phone, which was a very important design feature. But if you happen to have a cell phone, you get to record and share that back with the community. Uh, that's inspired and sparked many scientific ideas, many places and inventions that would not have been even possible because you would not have thought about that context. And also, lots of community members have charged upon and built community projects around full scopes, all the way in healthcare and human health, detecting fake drugs, uh, being able to bring disease diagnostics to farmers around the world. There are many applications that spawned on it, which were primarily driven by community members, which is something that I am incredibly proud of, because then really the ownership of the ideas belongs to the communities that face these problems. And what's so fascinating, too, is that it all started with these limitations of we need something that is accessible and mass-produced, and it really embodies frugal science. Um, for our listeners who may not be familiar with the term, can you define frugal science? Yeah, I think it's it really, for me, it's been a framework. Uh, I've been thinking about these ideas. It's very different from an ad hoc solution. Uh, there are lots of ways of you know duct taping something for something to quickly work as a quick solution. Frugal science is not that. In my mind, frugal science are inventive principles that you apply to difficult problems that have eluded uh, society for a while, because if there was an easy solution, somebody would have come up with that. Uh, but keeping in focus the accessibility and the affordability and making sure that the cost constraint is a key parameter in the design itself. So it's frugal and simple, but sometimes it is actually much harder to get to a simple solution because it ends up not being an off-the-shelf solution. As engineers, we are often used to thinking about you know, putting parts together from already available technologies to build something, but that adds its own complexity, that adds its own cost, and I think it doesn't scale. So frugal science is really looking at the essence of the problem and saying, ah, I see a light at the end of the tunnel. And again, you know, we explore hundreds of ideas around a single problem until we come up with something that feels right. And there is truly an aha moment. Of course, when we share that with the world, if it truly is the right kind of tool, it spreads very quickly because it's affordable. You use the word simple, and it's a word that I've heard you use before. Um, along with words such as mundane. And these are things uh, both conceptually and materially fascinate you. Uh, why now, though, is frugal science gaining some mainstream momentum? I think, you know, I, I've been doing this for a long while now, and just to me, it's the obvious approach I can imagine, because we don't live on a planet with infinite resources. Uh, we should just first understand that this planet is finite, its resources are finite, what's accessible to people is finite, but we still have these phenomenal challenges and the amount of inequality that exists in our culture, in how people are treated, in how opportunities are available to people, that inequality keeps growing. And unless we take an approach of making things accessible to people, both literally physically and opportunities that come with them, I think we will just be spiraling in a set of a society with just haves and have-nots. And this really has nothing to do with developed or developing countries. You know, this is a problem that's literally fundamentally ingrained in every society. Uh, so I think personally to me, it's been a movement because I see it empowering people. I've seen it firsthand how it's changed lives. I know personally Foldscope users that started from, you know, all the way from picking up their signs while they were living in a large slum colony in a specific country and then ended up being a researcher in a traditional setting and a scientist primarily because they found their passion and love for science by tinkering with the Foldscope. So I think this is very real and personal to me. And in some sense, I've often felt that it resonates with people primarily because they see that they have a role to play in it. It's not just about many times we build and share our frugal science tools, 
uh, it should evoke a feeling that, ah, I could have done it. And when that happens, that is exactly the point, because it's not just about providing the tools. It really is about sparking a moment when everybody feels that they are problem solvers. You know, whether you're a scientist or not, that doesn't matter. All of us are problem solvers, and if we think deeply about it, there are simple and possibly even mundane solutions to problems and some of the biggest problems that we have in front of us. I'm glad that you mentioned this uh, I can do it attitude because your introduction to science, though somewhat unconventional, uh, is really rooted in your ability to perform scientific experiments and have this access that many may not have had, and, and perhaps it's opportunistic. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your early scientific memories and experiences? Yeah, I think it's much of the discovery of looking for new ideas is rooted for me in tinkering and looking at just everyday objects around me carefully. And that just comes from, I grew up in India in a semi-rural town with limited sets of resources. And, you know, I didn't need a scientific lab in the school. The world was my scientific lab. And I had my brother by my side mentoring me from time to time. And I think that's really dramatically shaped and focused of how I look at this world. And personally, to me, the joy that you get, you know, we all do science because we want to experience the joy of making our own discoveries. And at that moment, it doesn't really matter if somebody else has also made that discovery. It's just that you were able to unfold a little peel of this onion we call nature just by yourself. It's so deeply rooted in how I think about science. And so this is why I also don't make any distinctions between applied and basic science. They're just two sides of exactly the same coin. And in uh, literally a flash of a second, a very fundamental basic idea can become an incredibly applied idea. And the other way around, uh, technology or a focus on trying to solve a very applied problem can, in a flash of a second in somebody's mind, become just one of these most fundamental problems to tackle. So I think it just, I have just lived my life that way, and personally I just feel that the where we stand as a society, we need more and more people to utilize logic and scientific thinking, not just that they have to be scientific professionals, but the only way in my mind to do that is to make the tools of science and the methods of science more accessible. You had access to some fascinating uh, tools, though, in your childhood, including uh, nitric acid, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think was, those are misfortunes in some sense. I uh, was living in India, and the house that we rented, the landlord had kicked out a professor who used to live there who couldn't pay his rent. Uh, and he used to have a chemistry lab, but of course the landlord did not know that this was a chemistry lab, so they just dumped all these chemicals in the basement of a, almost a dungeon in some sense, and I inherited it when five years later with cobwebs. And But, you know, some of the chemicals still survived, and I spent several years organizing this space, and I was quite young at that time, I think I sometimes worry how I survived that those days, but it also made me a little bit hardy about trying to experiment. And, you know, personally to me, you do your best work when nobody's watching. It really is not about others. It's about yourself. And the sense of being able to just tinker in a basement of an uh, unknown location and just be immersed with that was just a beautiful experience. And I try to kind of replicate that in much of the work we do. You talked about now how you are um, this play-based, exploratory, uncontrolled experience with science in your childhood has steered you towards some of the themes that are now prevalent in your work. I'm curious how you balance maintaining those themes with some of the pressures that are placed on science uh, and some of the rigors, especially now in this pandemic time. How do you strike that balance? Yeah, I think to me it's, uh, you know, curiosity is the source of ideas, but in parallel, uh, you need to develop your analytical skills and really be able to take an observation and truly understand the heart of how and why. And so I think to me, 
the balance really just comes from there is a back burner of problems that I'm personally thinking about in my life. For the last 10 years, they've primarily been health problems. They've been problems in the context of global health and thinking a lot about um, you know, how we make the set of these scientific tools accessible, but more and more so the themes are transitioning and we're also thinking about environmental challenges and the context of what does it mean to live on a planet that we are now passing on to our kids. So there is this back burner of problems that I'm always thinking about. And in parallel, there is a stream of just observations and these day-to-day tinkerings. And then in a splash of a second, sometimes there is a crosshatch and you realize that, ah, you know, I have a way forward here because of this. I'm curious about that. Describe the, the moment, the aha moment. What is that like for you? <laughs> you know, I think it's, uh, I'll give you a COVID example. So as a lab, we have really pivoted to support COVID work around the world. You know, this is a disease that's literally holding the world hostage, for the lack of a better word. If there was one time of a war-like uh, scenario where scientists and I had hoped federal governments and everybody would come together to fight this. This was the time. I'd been thinking about testing for a while and just this idea that, you know, diagnostic tests have been around, but they just cost so much. I spoke to a colleague in Bolivia and they said they're paying $400 for this RT-PCR test, the one that's been rolled out. And most of those tests actually catch people after they have gone through their infectious phase anyway. And I had been playing with uh, my kid's flashlight, which is this hand-powered flashlight that essentially spins a rotor that allows you to make light mechanically without using batteries. And personally, it occurred to me where... Wouldn't it be interesting if we truly had a home-based test, uh, which is completely electricity-free? And one of the challenges in infrastructure associated with doing tests with saliva is centrifugation. Because saliva has a lot of gunk, you really have to also get the sets of separation processes, but, you know, they require a much more traditional framework that you couldn't build in a home test. And then as a lab, we just released uh, what we call a handy-fuge lamp, it's a COVID test that could be done at home using saliva. It costs roughly a dollar, five dollars in parts. So that's kind of one of an aha moment. I literally did borrow my kids' flashlight for this, and they've been a little bit upset about it. But on the other hand, we now have a test that we are starting to scale. We are shipping kits to Bolivia and Kuwait, and we are looking in the U.S. to do a large-scale pilot for schools to really demonstrate that something like this could be done on a daily basis, that you could wake up in the morning, do your test, and even if the sensitivity and the specificity is different from a PCR test, you will, if you do two of them, you, then you can go get your formal official test. Right. So this, it's fair to say that COVID has sort of taken over uh, your science, and is that something that sort of comes with the territory of being this great mind with the capabilities of instrumentation and resources. Uh, I suppose my question is, how do you feel about this sudden uh, takeover in your focus? Yeah, I think it's, it's been hard. And at that same time, it's emotional. What's really happening in the world, there is no way to look away. Just personally, and you know, this is not just me personally as a lab, We looked at each other and asked ourselves a question. Look, here is a great need. This is a a once-in-a-hundred-year kind of an event. I hope so. And we are really the boots on the ground in many cases. I saw, I was in France coming back in February, and I saw firsthand what was unfolding. And then I arrived in the U.S., and I didn't really see a kind of response gearing up. And so personally, we really asked ourselves this question that, look, we can be ourselves safe, but what about the everyday healthcare worker that's getting out there that's fighting this disease? What about the doctors that are on the front line and literally the millions of people? And at that time, that was just a prediction because it was just a hunch. The disease had not exploded in this way. And unfortunately, our worst nightmares did end up coming true. So it, it really has spiraled all of our lives. Many scientists would say that that is true. But I'm also just humbled by both the generosity of people and the generosity of scientists themselves 
to engage with each other. You know, most of the projects that I'm leading are large-scale consortiums that we've been able to build with people, volunteers across the world, contributing, sharing, being completely open. All our work related to COVID is listed on our website, and it's completely open. Anybody can replicate. And there is this joy. You share something, an idea, an implementation, and within 24 hours, you know, 10 groups around the world are replicating it. And then within two weeks, uh, there are entities filing for, you know, medical and official approvals in multiple countries trying to take those solutions to hands of people. I mean, we've seen that over and over again now in the PPE space we've been working on in diagnostics now for ventilators. So it's really been a humbling experience. And at that same time, the rigor of science needs to remain. And that's really been one of our major roles is to make sure that we can convince ourselves and the scientific community before any innovations get adopted. So it's been hard, but I am just so blessed I get to work with an incredible group of uh, lab members just in my own lab, individuals that literally dropped everything in their lives, including, you know, sleeping and anything to really be able to take action. But then also very generous individuals around the world that have been able to engage. You've described uh, two gaps that you believe uh, the creation of devices like the fold scope and the paper fugue bring to light. What more can science do to help simultaneously bridge these gaps in training or knowledge and, and also instrumentation or access? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because I felt we are very good at bringing and moving forward the frontiers of science extremely rapidly. But on the other hand, as scientists, do we take the burden and ownership of bringing these tools and technologies and making that accessible such that an average person, and I really do mean an average person has a role to play here, can both absorb the benefits of these tools and also imply these sets of principles that are discovered in their own lives, in their own manner, so that they get to play the same role of scientists. So I think the big gap, and again, this is why we shared full scope, because we didn't know what these tools are good for. I mean, a capability is just a capability. If you are anywhere in the world and for a price of just a cup of coffee, you have the capacity to watch microbial life anywhere. What does that mean to the world? I actually don't know. Honestly, I don't think any scientist can answer that question. Without bringing these sets of technologies in hands of people, and letting them explore and share, that really builds upon the sense of the kind of context that usually scientific ideas need to truly shine. So I think for us, we have literally spent almost more than half our time, not just in invention, but in deployment, not just in design, but in delivery. And that teaches us so much. Uh, and again, it's it's also a very enriching experience as a scientist, you know. I can say literally on my WhatsApp, right before you had called, I have messages from Tanzania, Iraq, and Bolivia, literally using these sets of tools and asking questions and sharing between each other the sets of ideas that they came up with yesterday. And that level of pace is really hard to follow, but at that same time, it is essential for us as scientists to be the mentors to pass the torch of science broadly. Because, you know, universities and academia definitely will remain the pinnacle of knowledge, and we have built a system to preserve that. But what about outside these walls? You know, we live in such a polarized world right now that if that does not percolate outside, eventually we might find less and less acceptance of scientific principles. So I think it's bothered me quite a lot, and just that's that's been one of the drivers. But on the other hand, uh, I've also seen firsthand uh, how people's lives can change once they start building their own lives around scientific principles and logic. So I think it's worth it. You've talked about passing the torch now and, and living on, in essence. And one of the things about the fold scope is that it lives on, not just for its owners, but for its creators. Uh, and for scientists. Can you tell us a little bit about the Oncoscope, which has just recently here gained some prominence and recognition? 
Yeah, I think Oncoscope is derivative. I call many of them as the big brothers of Foldscope. This is an idea that I work with with a team of undergraduates in a class that I teach. Uh, and one of the factors there is to really bring low-cost, almost in-situ imaging in a diagnostic setting. I spent some time in Cameroon with collaborators learning about how onchocerciasis is detected, and one of the tests is a skin snip. It's an extremely painful test that you pull your skin and then you literally cut a tiny piece of it. You could imagine how painful that is, but also just it's extremely uh, poor in its sensitivity and specificity. So we started thinking about how we could bring a low-cost, almost in vivo imaging uh, for human patients, and uh, that led to the oncoscope. And one of the perspectives is to really be able to do low-cost imaging directly in a capillary bed. And the exciting part is we now have the first sets of instruments done and built, uh, and we'll be taking that to the field back again in Cameroon to do human testing. I think, again, one of the things that I am excited about is, you know, Foldscope is the tip of the iceberg. There is a large number of microscopy tools we've been working, including Oncoscope, but also Octopi, Squid, and very recently also Planktoscope. These are all microscopy-based tools, but they bring automation, and they are, to me, the big brother. Octopi is applied for malaria. Plankton scope is really applied to the problem of microplastic detection and ecological surveillance in aquatic waters. Squid is a much more of a general purpose uh, imaging tool that we are trying to bring automation to the table, but all of them still are extremely cost effective. For example, Octopi just costs around $100 and can do automated detection of malaria in the field using microscopy. So it's been a fascinating world to just ask what is the not just one tool, but what is the army of tools that we need for different contexts? And then how do we make them general purpose and modular enough that people can really see a broader vision around them and start mixing and matching to build the tools that are needed? That was part one of our conversation with Stanford University's Dr. Manu Prakash. Join us next time on All Things Photonics, episode three of season two, as we pick up where we left off and rejoin Dr. Manu Prakash for more. Enjoying season two of All Things Photonics and part one of our conversation with Stanford University's Dr. Manu Prakash. On this podcast, we bring you insights from some of today's leading scientific minds. It is their work, often to our amazement and usually to our awe, that is taking on some of the foremost challenges present in society today. We marvel at their creativity, just as we admire their perseverance. We invite them to share their stories with you, because more often than not, their work is poised to make a difference in our lives. One of the things about science is that just when you think you've heard it all, something new crawls along. Remember that word, crawling. It turns out the solutions to some pretty high-level problems in biomedical imaging are found in our basements. Spider silk, it turns out, is a material with limitless potential in making superior optical lenses. Here's Sarah Weiler. Researchers at Tam Kang University and National Yang Ming University in Taiwan turned to spider silk while investigating easier, cheaper ways to develop lenses. And what isn't more readily available than spiders? Spider silk has been a material of interest to designers for a long time because of its high elasticity, its toughness, and its tensile strength. In fact, relative to its weight, some spider silk is stronger than steel. It's also non-toxic to living tissue. This research team chose daddy long leg spiders because they're common in Taiwan. What they discovered after dripping a resin onto smooth dragline silk, the strongest silk a spider makes, is that the silk naturally forms the resin into a dome shape. This dome, after being cured in ultraviolet radiation, then becomes employable as a lens. And the best part, this phenomenon results in optimal quality imaging. The beam produced after shining a laser through the dome lens is called a photonic nanojet, or PNJ. 
PNJs are already popular for many biomedical nanoimaging applications because of the superior focusing capability they provide near a surface. And now, spiders can help improve PNJs. Spider silk dome lenses focus more efficiently than those produced through synthetic, multi-material lenses. The lens also consists of only one material, the resin, and can be reshaped easily in the condensing process. Chang Yang Lu, one of the scientists on the team, said, a flexible PNJ like this is suitable for imaging the nanoscale objectives in different depths within biological tissue, adding that these lenses can be cast into different sizes to make longer or shorter photonic nanojets. Before commercializing spider silk lenses and thereby enhancing the performance of biomedical imaging equipment, some challenges still need to be addressed. The most notable challenge, how to deal with out-of-plane scattering which is a common phenomenon in all imaging that reduces the intensity of a photonic nanojet. But in spite of that, the possibilities for these silk lenses to deliver much needed light have researchers caught in their web. So, what isn't to love about spiders? That does it for this episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our engineer, Alan Shepard, and to Joel Williams with the news. Our featured music is courtesy of betterwithmusic.com. Most of all, thank you, our listeners. As always, you can share your thoughts, pick us ideas, let us know how we're doing. You can reach us at all things at photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google, as well as on our website. Subscribe, never miss an episode. I'm Jake Saltzman. This has been a Photonics Media Production.